Let's pray. God, as O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, and in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew, the fifth chapter, the first 16 verses. Hear now the word of God. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach him. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for, their, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. For the next seven weeks, there will be six sermons on the Sermon on the Mount. The title of this sermon series is How to Build Your House on a Rock. And so we're going to deal with that over the next seven weeks. We're going to let the women go on their retreat, but we're not going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to talk about them while they're gone. <laughs> no, it's going to be Scout Sunday that Sunday, so they're going to get a reprieve. But over the next seven Sundays, we'll be talking about the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard this, but I'll tell it to you again. If somebody wanted to know about God and Jesus, they would, we'd tell them, read the Bible. And if they said, I don't want to know that much, I think some of you have said that. <laughs> well, read the New Testament. Well, I'm not sure I want to know that much. Well, read the four Gospels. Well, that might be a stretch too. Well, if you can't read the four Gospels, read the Gospel of John. Well, I really don't want to know that much. Well, then read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. Well, that's more than I want to read. Well, read Luke 15. Lost sheep, lost coin. Lost son. I don't want to know that much. Well, read the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 through 7. If you want to know what God is about, what God wants and desires from all of us, you will read this. It's important. Now, what does a Christian look like? I Googled it. I put in Google images and I said, Christian. And I saw several men named Christian. <laughs> I saw people wearing crosses around their necks. I saw Madonna. I saw Puff Daddy. I saw a number of people with crosses. Some, I saw some with rosary beads with a crucifix in the hand. I saw somebody sitting or kneeling at a chancel rail. I saw somebody raising their hands in praise of God in worship. 
I really didn't get a good idea what Christian's supposed to look like by Googling. In the first century, before the first century, and even today, if I asked you what happens in your life when you consider yourself blessed? What are the things that would be seen in your life? Most of us would have something to say, maybe not out loud, but you would think it, wealth. If I, got, if I got wealth, I'm happy. I'm blessed. I've got health. I've got a happy wife or a happy husband. I've got children. Things like that, we would say, I'm a blessed person. If we become aggravated with things that are going on in life, we would tend to say, I'm not so blessed anymore. If we have struggles, things are not going the way we had laid out our life to be, we might say we're not blessed, wouldn't we? What we need to know is that the Sermon on the Mount is about the reversals of values. What we tend to value in our life and what is important, truly important, to God, to Jesus. Now, so when we go look in the Bible and we want to know when God wants to reveal himself to his people, usually a mountain is involved. Moses is walking along. He, he's taking care of the sheep of his father-in-law, and he turns the corner, and there's a bush burning on a mountain. And God reveals himself to Moses. Time later, he's on a mountain, Mount Sinai, when God gives Moses the law. At the end of Moses' life, he lets him walk up on the mountain to see how he is going to deliver his people over to that promised land. Didn't get to go there. Jesus reveals himself to these disciples on a mountain. The temple is on a mount. Jesus is crucified on a mount. Who God is is revealed in mountains. And so when we come to this blessedness and these beatitudes where Jesus is telling them, blessed are you, the values that he is talking about maybe don't line up with what we think. He begins by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? Blessed are the poor people. If I was poor, my spirit would be so low. Yeah, I need, yeah, okay. If I was poor, I would need to be blessed. No, that's not what he's talking about. Someone who is poor in spirit is bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt. They have, are standing before God and there is nothing that they have or any means to justify themselves to God. They understand exactly what Paul writes about when Paul writes in Romans, for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. And God demonstrates his great love for us that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. We cannot approach God on an equal footing thinking I am blessed, I have wealth, I have health, I have everything the, the world wants, and think that you can be accepted by God. It's truly, to be blessed in God's economy is to say that I am spiritually bankrupt. I cannot stand before God unless somebody intercedes for me. I need someone to save me. That's where we are. I cannot do it 
on my own. Neither can you. No one has ever been able to justify themselves by themselves. And they understand that they are spiritually, morally bankrupt. And the people who find themselves and know that truth, Jesus says, thus is the kingdom of God. When we are in that place, the kingdom of God will break into our lives. It's a wonderful thing when we understand that. And then Jesus says, blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. The people we're talking about mourning are not those who have lost loved ones, those who are in bad shape, those who have a lot of, have lost something. The people who mourn are those who are mourning because of their spiritual bankruptcy. They're weeping because of what they've done and who they've been in the sight of God. And they will be comforted. When you get in that spot, the next logical thing is that we should be blessed because we're meek. When you understand that we can't do it on our own, and we mourn that fact, our hearts have become soft. They become pliable. They're not hard. Meekness, in, if you're a potter, meekness means that the clay, you can do something with it. If it's not meek, only thing that will happen is it will break. And so we're able to be molded into who God wants us to be when we are meek and pliable. And when we come to that place where we understand our bankruptcy, when we mourn that and we experience the kingdom of God and we are comforted, we understand that we need to be who God wants us to be. And in the process of doing that, we are molded. It means spending time with God in prayer and in reading his word, spending time with other Christians, learning, being who God wants us to be, which looks different than what the world wants us to look like. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. It's that wonderful blend of knowing grace, and truth. You remember in the Gospel of John is the story about the woman caught in adultery? We see this wonderful blend of truth and grace. Those men who caught her and bring her to the field of Jesus to try to catch him, and they were all about truth. The law says this, and this is what you get. Right? This is what you get. They had their stones. They were ready to fling them. Jesus, being the perfect balance of truth and grace, is writing something in the, in the sand. And then he asked them the question, who among you is sin-free? So whoever who is sin-free cast the first stone. One by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they drop their stones and leave. And then Jesus said to her, ask her, where are those who accuse you? And then he says to her, go and sin no more. He didn't deny that she had sinned, but he was a perfect blend of truth and grace. So many times in our lives, if we do things by the world standard, we give grace to those who don't deserve it, and we give truth to the ones that don't need it. And it's a hard place to be. But that's who we're supposed to be, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. For they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. hard part about life itself is that showing mercy. There are people who cannot forgive other people. They have such a grudge against other people. 
a hatred toward other people. It's a painful thing to watch that. And what I found is that so, more, so often, and what I have come to understand, is that for those who are unable to forgive, the God they worship is one who is not merciful to them, or they don't understand how much they have been forgiven. Because something happens when you're not able to be merciful. Because people who are, hold a grudge and are angry all the time, they are no fun to be around. Amen? Who wants to be around somebody who always brings up something in a hateful manner to some, about somebody else? If you'd have known what they did to me, preacher, there's no way you would have forgiven me either. But when we show mercy to somebody, we give up something. We give up the thing that will bind us to something that will destroy us. We do. And we are, we are forgiving and merciful so that we might be forgiven and we might be set free from the things that bind us to the things that God doesn't want us to be about. Those who cannot forgive more times than not, I would say, don't think their sins are as bad as other people's. And we need to be set free from the things that bind us together. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Those who are pu- pure in heart understand that they have not arrived yet. They seek to get something. Better. They know there, there is something better out there, and that is that they will see God. This past Thursday, I didn't find out of this till yesterday, but my pastor, before I went into, right before I went into ministry and while I was first in ministry, died this past Thursday, Reverend Pat Shannon. A dear, dear friend. The things that he did for me to enable me to be where I am today is just unbelievable. In the midst of his humor, his sarcasm, and all that he was, you could see God. You could see God at work. And in the process of being who he was, I am a better person because I saw God through him. And I am better for it. And I praise God for the people who I have been able to see God in their life to the point where it changed who I was. Because those instruments who seek a pure heart allow us to see God in ways we've never seen before. And that's who we need to be for people around us. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Jesus is called the Son of God, the Son of Man. He says we need to be peacemakers. Usually, when our country sends peacekeepers somewhere to keep the peace, what they're really doing is, if somebody breaks the peace, we're going to kill them. Right? We send them with weapons. That's what we do. They're peacekeepers. Sometimes we kill people on both sides because they aren't willing to keep the peace. What Jesus is saying is peacemakers. And when you're a peacemaker, you go in in the midst of them. In the midst of the war, the warring factions to bring bring them together. That's what Jesus did. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And they killed him. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. You see, this is, doesn't sound like something we want, really. It's not what we really want. We want to be blessed with wealth, health, and all those things, but... 
Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, and they persecuted him. What Jesus is saying in the midst of all these blessed is what he said in other places where he said, if you're going to be my disciple, you must take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. And in the process of following Jesus, we will point other people to him. And then he says that we are salt. Salt. He doesn't say you can be salt. And he says, we're going to be light. We are light, the light of the world. And we're, we're going to, we might not be light. We're to be salt and light. And the things I know about salt and light is that when they touch something else, they change something. I love what salt does to potatoes, fried potatoes. Don't y'all I really do. There's something about the right amount of salt that makes in me thirsty for something else. Doesn't it? Y'all know what it is in your life. That beverage that you just love to drink. I love salt. But you could be like me. Years ago, I was going to drive home from a somewhere up in Washington. I think I was somewhere in Northern Virginia. And it was 7 o'clock, and I'm in Richmond, Virginia. And I'm kind of tired from a long day. And I go in the Shoney's to get the largest cup of coffee I could get. And I tore about eight packs of salt and put it in my coffee. <sighs> Needless to say, there was coffee running down the side of my truck as I was dumping it out. You know, there are some things that you don't want too much of, and salt is one of them. It really will. Sometimes what we think is salt is not something that will cause us to crave something else. And so we have to be careful about this salt. Light in the light, you know, light in the light in much. But light in the darkness, boy, that is a beautiful thing. And so Jesus calls us and tells us that we are to be salt and light in a world that's thirsty and needing both. And so how do we do that? I think we have to change and reverse our values. Reversing our values so that we can know what it really means to be blessed. You see, there is a world that's dying to be blessed by Christ. And when we live out our faith, the way he talks about here, not only will we be blessed, but the world will too. Y'all want to be blessed? God wants us to be blessed too. And the world wants to be blessed as well. Let us pray. Lord God, may we know what it means to be blessed. Let us know the meaning, true meaning of what it means to be spiritually poor. To mourn and grieve because of our spiritual bankruptcy. Change our hearts so that we are meek and can be molded we can be pliable and we can seek truth and peace we can seek all the things that you seek Lord we ask this prayer in your son's holy name Amen